Well, thank you for being here, Darwin. You're welcome. And Dawn. We've got the three Ds. Yes, <laughs> Therese, Dawn, and Darwin. So this scripture reading, as I already introduced, marks a significant change for that early Christian church. How it moved from a small group of exclusively Jewish um, believers in including Gentiles. Um, the, 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 the story that just comes before our reading makes a um, really radical point how, um, where's my, how this church moved, and how Peter, yeah, here we go, how Peter had to move his social boundaries, and that's the church from associating with or visiting with the Gentiles. <coughs> Only being Jewish to associating with and visiting with Gentiles. And our scripture reading this morning proclaims saying that the message spread throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. So Don, I want to begin with you. Um, and we signify this really in the baptism uh, right of our church that change is an integral part of that Christian journey. If you can say a little bit more about that, please. Sure. I, um, when Dries was talking about change and grief you know, and, and identifying places within not only the Christian tradition, but of course within our broader communication with the Jewish tradition and with other traditions, um, baptism obviously incarnation, death and resurrection, but I wanted to focus on three that I'll just bring to the fore. And the first is creation itself. And whether, you know, we look at the metaphoric way that it's portrayed and given to us in Genesis, and even thinking about the Big Bang itself, that was a moment of profound change and transformation. But what I love about the scripture is the divine expresses a moment of vulnerability. If we read the text closely, we see that God says repeatedly, let there be. It isn't a command, it's an invitation. Let there be light, let there be day, let there be waters separated. And what's even more profound for me anyway, because if you read, um, there are quite a few commentaries out there that will um, speak to the point that God said that it was good. But if you look at the Hebrew, Frank, back me up, it's not, it's not God said, it's God saw, ra'a. And there's a difference in saying and being a witness to and recognizing once God has opened up the possibility of creation, of God standing back and, say, and seeing, ah, look what has come forth. It's a profound moment of vulnerability, even in the life of God. And if God can be so vulnerable, in the face of such change. And where else do we see profound changes in incarnation? We're also told in scripture that Christ did not account equality with God as something to be hoarded or clung to, but emptied self of the divine, becoming one with us, another expression of vulnerability. So again and again, we are brought to a place of vulnerability. It's not only a part of our human condition, but it is how God reflects God's self, reflects the sacred in the world as one of change, of vulnerability, of community. We have that in the Trinity, the sense that God is always in community with God's self and with us. So it's this beautiful weaving across our tradition, I think, of change, vulnerability, and then of course, we're getting ready, after having celebrated Christmas, of, get, of preparing in February for Advent incarnation and death and resurrection. So we have these beautiful seasons that follow the seasons of the planet. Again, this profound intimacy of relationship. But I think for me, I love this. I try to live a let there be. <laughs> That's how I try to approach um, whether it's change, whether it's positive or challenging or just sort of neutral. I try to have that, that same openness to whatever God and the world is bringing for me, knowing that the divine is always drawing us towards peace, justice, and wholeness. Thank you, Don. The divine that grieves yeah, throughout that change grieves. as well. So Don, from your work in, in grief within our community, um, how do you relate to this theology of change that 
Well, I would Don say explained. that um, for me, being in the midst of grief is probably one of the most I think I'm going to um, just put this a little higher. There we go. How's that? Okay. One thing about grief, you have to find your voice. <laughs> there you go. I would say, for me, uh, working with grief, um, being somebody that facilitates groups, but also in my own grief experience, it's probably one of the most spiritual and intimate experiences that I can have. And I think the reason it is that way is that um, when somebody comes to me that's grieving, you're absolutely, the word, vulnerable. We are vulnerable because all of a sudden, our world has totally changed. And when we're vulnerable, what do we do with that vulnerability? And I think that it's, it's a sacred moment because we honor it and we allow ourselves to enter into the presence of what does it mean to acknowledge loss? Um, and I think the church, you know, you, you mapped it out so well with the liturgical church. I mean, the church is really about grief and about resurrection and a process that keeps on, on, and on. That's the world that we live in. And yet, we are in the midst of a world that is also really struggling with that. Um, and so, I, have a, I, I bring props with me, you know, sometimes, he saw me this morning, he said, wait, got your whole office with old, you? Old school props, I mean, yeah. you still have a picture to show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Actually, uh, would you be my Vanna White and uh, just show that? <laughs> You have to move your hand across. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a um, cultural difference here. There we go. There, there you go. So, okay, describe what you see there. It's a picture of what? Well, it's a picture of a hurricane or a storm. Right. Yeah. And it's a place that was so sacred. It is so sacred to me. It's a place that my significant other and I would travel to almost on every vacation, and it was um, in Puerto Vallarta. And one time when we were there, I saw this picture, and it's a picture of Puerto Vallarta in a storm. And you know, that's the reality of what happens with grief. All of a sudden, our world just totally changes. And so when our world totally changes, there's an element of, who can I trust? Who should I talk to? And I think it's one of those places why it's such an invitation to be sacred. Because all of a sudden, I'm in a space that I need to talk and be who I am. So <clears throat> what you just described is a sense of individual grief. Right. Is there such a sense of collective grief as well? Okay. Um, collective grief is really kind of a new term, even for me. And I, I think uh, we, it's, it's become so much more real uh, since COVID. You know, we became so aware that it was not only one person's journey, but it was our entire journey. Um, I guess on a, on a, when I think about collective grief just the past year, I think about how um, we often see in the news things about politicians or actors, and, and if they're famous, then we see their picture. And sometimes people say, I, I can't believe that I, I was grieving over a picture of somebody I don't know. And I found that, um, you know, even with Queen Elizabeth, for example, a lot of people said they felt like there was this connection. Well, there's this connection because we'd see her. There was a consistency that she was a world leader that we could kind of look to and respect. Not editorializing here, but um, there was a sense that she represented something that was important to me. And I shared that with a friend of mine, an African American man. He's just a delightful man. And he said, You know, I have to tell you, I had a dream about her after she died. And I said, well, What's your dream? And he said, Well, first of all, I was surprised that a, a black man was having a, an audience with the Queen. And so I told her that. And, but the other thing he said that was really strange, he said, she was hanging upside down. So I said, well, what do you make of that? He said, I don't know. I guess, it, I guess it's, I think that whole system that she represents, I don't like it, but she's a nice lady. <laughs>
And I think that's really what grief is on some levels. You know, an element of, of recognizing what is it that we really don't like? Because sometimes it's a matter of an opportunity to let go of pain, but it's also an opportunity to change. And um, I, um, I think one of my first experiences with grief in a, in a community setting was when I worked as the director of pastoral care at a, at a hospital, St. Luke's Lutheran Hospital. And when I was there, it became St. Luke's Baptist Hospital. And you know, that, that was a hard adjustment. That was a part of my identity. I'm a Lutheran pastor, so I accepted the change. And yet, the day they came to take down the marquee, I just remember like somebody had taken something and stabbed it into me. And I share that experience, not because I'm mad that it's Baptist Hospital now, but I had to process the anger that I had when it was happening. And that's what I think grief really brings about, is a sense of so many feelings we just aren't always um, expecting. If I, if I can jump in quickly, you're reminding me, Darwin Olson, some folks have read the book here, but Walter Brueggemann talks about, and there's another Korean theologian, Kent named Kim, whose last name is Kim, talks about the power of lament and how if we don't have systems for lament, that that can actually uh, deprive communities of political agency because we have to have collective forms where we come together and we confess and we recognize the ills or bad policies or policies that have been destructive. And then once we have experienced this anger, this sadness, this how could this be, this taking responsibility for those of us who are experiencing privilege, then there's a sense of being able to move forward in solidarity to change because those have been collectively, in fact, Brueggemann will go so far as to say if we don't have those mechanisms in place publicly and we lack a lot of places for public lament, then that suppresses our engagement and it suppresses our way to resist um, practices of empire and colonialism and oppression. And so how can the church, I think one of our questions is how can we as a church be a place that fosters not only conversations like this but practices of lament towards transformation that allows us to be in a place of grief, of anger, of confusion, a feeling alone and yet also recognizing that we are in this together. And I would want to also just say at this point uh, how much I appreciate the mission of this church. Diversity, inclusion, advocacy, um, you're out there and I respect that and I love this church for that. And um, I think one of the things that, as you're saying, in order to do that and do that well, we have to learn how to grieve well. And I don't think as a culture we do that. Our culture is so ready to fix it, so ready to get over it, and so ready to uh, um, not allow it to be a process. So what does it mean? So Darwin, I'm, I look at my own life, and um, there were times, if looking back now, there were obviously times that I experienced grief in my life, but at that point in time I didn't recognize it as grief. Mm -hmm. well, how, how do we know we are experiencing grief? Mm -hmm. And then how you said grief well. What does it mean to grieve well? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I know we didn't talk about no, this. No, that's but good. Yes. I, but it's a great question. And I think it's to grieve well to me is to first of all be honest with myself. Who am I and what am I experiencing? Why am I feeling sad? Why am I reacting to something that's happening in our culture? Why am I angry? Anger is not bad, but I think anger often is like, I say it's the fever of mental health. It kind of tells me something else is going on. And so grieving well is, um, I think, naming it, acknowledging it, uh, and then uh, sharing it with somebody, and again, sharing it with safe people, sharing it with people you trust. That's why we do the LGBT groups. I mean, those of us that are LGBT, we have learned that we cannot, we, we can, but it's difficult to share your journey with people that don't totally understand that journey. 
So um, even the other groups that we offer through Port of Loring, we have groups for, for women who have lost their husband, men who have lost their wives. Again, we've found that bringing people together that understand each other is so important. So it's a matter of, of finding safe spaces that we can find people who will support us, encourage us, and don't fix us. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, it's kind of interesting to me because you mentioned anger. Mm -hmm. um, so for me in my ministry, I've experienced anger in different places, um, especially when a spouse died unexpectedly. There's a lot of time anger and it invokes guilt and shame within people mm -hmm. that I will feel anger towards my spouse who deceased. But even in a congregational context and in community context, when big change, when we experience big changes, it sometimes goes hand in hand with anger, mm -hmm. and we don't know where that anger comes from. So you say there's this connection between grief and anger. Oh yeah, I think, like I say, I, I, anger has a tendency, if I, if I trace it, it goes back to what am I really angry about? And once I can name that, it helps me to, to make some decisions about what am I gonna do with that anger? And I, you know, we talked earlier about doing justice, we talked earlier about doing things that make a difference. That's putting our anger in place. But in relationships too, if I'm angry, you know, what am I projecting? What am I needing to, to figure out what that anger is about? So I guess I would, not, I would simply say there is no right or wrong to any feelings. All feelings need to be honored. And I think sometimes those of us, I grew up in a, in a home where we didn't express anger very much. Well, you uh, grew up in Minnesota. Of course. Minnesota nice. You, yeah. I'm a Minnesota you're, nice. You're a good Lutheran. I'm God's chosen frozen. Exactly. Yes. Uh, it's, now, we as Presbyterians claim that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably why we get along so well. <laughs> yeah. um, but again, it, learning how to be angry is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You know? And I think one of the things I... I brought with a resource. I think we need resources for our kids. Resources about how to be angry, how to express feelings, how to, this little book that a friend gave me is, is about how to, um, when your child is dealing with friendship, how to mend relationships with, with, with other children. And sometimes it means dealing with their anger. You know? So, um, I, th I mean, Don, you touched on it. Um, and I think as churches, how can we help communities, especially in the New Year? So this is, this is kind of interesting. We talk about grief, and it's the beginning of a new year. So we think of hope, we think of joy in the new year to come, and yet here yeah, we're talking about grief. And people... And people will say we need to be more optimistic in worship, or what is the good news? What is the good news in talking about grief at the beginning of a new year when we want to talk about hope and joy? Well, I think that you cannot have one without the... You know, we, we, we like to live in a sort of a dualistic frame where you're either happy or you're sad, or you're either good or you're bad. And it's really a spectrum. And so there's joy that can be tinged by a little bit of sorrow. There's hope that can also have um, shades of what if, and what if isn't a necessarily negative thing. I think it's how we approach it, because as you mentioned, Darwin, our emotions are a wellspring that are gifted to us for us to navigate our relationships, our communities, how we're with one another. And if we are continually judging ourselves by saying, I'm not happy enough, I'm not hopeful enough, then that puts a lot of unnecessary pressure upon us because who's, who's grading us? Is it influencers? Is it the media? Who's providing these images for us about what's happy enough, what's good enough? And so having those kind of conversations too, that in the same day, you can be surprised by joy to riff on C.S. Lewis and then plummeted into a moment of confusion because someone cut in front of you and that angered you and you're kind of, again, you're asking, well, why am I angered? Is this a boundary issue? Am I tired? Um, and so instead of judging ourselves so much, living into the vicissitudes, living into the seasons, because every day can have its season. Even an mm -hmm. hour can have its season. And that doesn't mean it's bad. 
It means that we're living into our humanness. We're living into that vulnerability. And so how do we journey together in this vulnerable place of being human and also aware that God's grace continually uplifts us? They're not mutually exclusive. You stated the grief um, process so well. Oh, thank you. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, a, it's a roller coaster. It's up and down and all around. Um, one of the most... I don't know, I have so many people in my life that have influenced me with their grief journey, but one just this past year, she's a woman that came to group, she had lost her son, and um, she said when, before he died, they had this great conversation, and he said, Mom, he said, I want you to be happy. And so she said, she came to group and she said, I am going to be happy. She says, right now I'm pissed as hell, but I'm going to be angry but I'm going to be happy. And then she talked about her choices right now were to, to grieve appropriately, appropriately live, grieve well, and um, it's amazing because she now is finding a new way to, to live. Now, one of the things that I think is so important is to realize that death ends, when we talk about um, personal grief, one of the things I have found to be so helpful in my own journey in processing the, the death of, of my significant other uh, is realizing that I bring his presence forward with me. And um, how do I do that? I do that through stories. I do that through um, being together with other people that knew him. Um, and so one of the things that I think is so important, like this, this woman that shared, she chose to be happy She's bringing the presence of her son every time she says his name. He's there with her. Um, but you can't do that in one hour. You can't do that in one year. You might do it over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And there's a great new book, a couple new books I just want to highlight. One, and I don't get any commission cut back on these. You know. <laughs> this is a book that is really good. It's called The Myth of Closure. Ambiguous loss in the time of the pandemic and change. And this person talks about how loss is really uh, often ambiguous, especially the losses that we're experiencing right now. Ambiguous in the sense that she, she um, talks about 9-11, so how many of those losses, you, they couldn't touch them. They couldn't, so it's a loss that still, it's out there. It's still, mm -hmm. So she says it's not about closure. Closure is what you do when you go to the bank. <laughs> it's about healing. And um, so that's, that's a book I would highly recommend. Well, thank you, Darwin. And I think it's a kind of good time to, um, you were going to share us a very personal letter uh, in, in, in closing our conversation uh, that you wrote to a friend. Yes. I had a friend that recently lost her husband. And uh, this friend is an incredible mentor in my life. Um, and so when I got her letter, I was so touched. And it was right as, as we were talking about doing this uh, class together, or this sermon together. So I wrote her this letter, and uh, with her permission, I'm going to share it with you today. And, and maybe, hopefully, you can hear something in it that you can apply to your life as well. Dear Juanita, I so appreciated your Christmas letter. In your style, you captured your challenging years with those love stories about your husband, Dick. The words, loving you, changed my life. But you know, losing you did the same. I've always known you, Juanita, to be a resilient person. And that statement in itself reveals why. This Sunday, I plan to share your wisdom. I've been invited to share the pulpit with another pastor, and we're going to explore how to get better with grief reminding ourselves that grief is not the enemy. Grief is grace that allows us to heal. Within our grief, God gives us the seed of healing. When we do this grief work, it helps us over time to adjust and adapt to a new life. Our culture often paints resilience as bouncing back, which leaves us feeling like everything will be the same. We certainly know that isn't the case. We won't be the same. We're different people. We have a new identity. We have a new path that we're on. Resilience is allowing ourselves to be reconciled to this new life. However, 
Don't leave the past behind you. Juanita, you have certainly demonstrated that by sharing these wonderful stories and pictures of your life with Dick. A quote from Tuesdays with Maury says, death ends a physical life, but not a relationship. You bring Dick forward every time you say his name and share stories about him. My go-to scripture that comforts and directs my life is the light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. Blessing and peace, Juanita, as you seek and experience the light in your continued life journey. So my hope and prayer for each of us today is that we can seek the light and let that light reveal truth and grace and peace and love. Amen. Thank Amen. You.